This episode was sponsored by Girls Can Crate, a unique subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. Real women make the best heroes, and every month they deliver them to your front door. And by Jill Harrigan, Heather McKinnon, Ellen Gross, Valerie Jacobson, Chantelle Oliver, Jamie Lang, Maria Sanchez, Mandy Booty, Monique Harris Pixado, Caitlin McTaggart, Deborah Butler, Carrie Turner, Nicole Broder, Morgan Lewis, Stephanie Faust, and Craig Williamson. Thank you so much for being our sponsors. We couldn't do it without you. Hi, Olivia. Hi, Katie. Here's my question. Mm. How much of your life do you think is just luck? Mm. Like uh, a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, give me a number. Ah. Uh, so Seventy-five percent, at least, I think. Really? Yeah. I wouldn't have thought you would think that. No, I, I used to give myself a lot more credit and a lot more blame, but the older <laughs> I get, the more I think that the majority of my life is just out of my control. Ah, I feel the same. Maybe even more. I might give it like ninety percent. Mm. Yeah, depending on the day. There's days when I'm there. and <laughs> Yeah, I think it's the Taoist in me that's just like, mm -hmm. uh, the universe is just swirling along. But the reason I ask is because today's episode is about fortune. Mm -hmm. And once I started really thinking about it, it occurred to me that it's a theme as old as human history. All the way back to ancient history, we see people talking about and depicting the wheel of fortune. Mm. I guess we're all just aware that we're spinning around on this wheel of fortune. Mm. It can lift us up. It could throw us down at any moment. Yeah. And today, Olivia, I'm going to tell you about Eileen Bowers. Mm. And her life illustrates fickle fortune so well. Honestly, I have no idea why they haven't made a movie about her because her life is cinematic in the extreme. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the gist of it. Poor Scottish lass sails to America, heads west with a gold rush. Mm. Have you ever heard of the Comstock load? Yes. That's her. What? <laughs> <laughs> she became one of the richest women in America. <laughs> wow, that's like the only person who made money off of the gold rush. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And, and how she got there and her dramatic turns on Fortune's Wheel, it's amazing. She spun from the bottom to dizzying heights, and you will not believe how it all ended. <laughs> so, a story about Fortune today. Finding it, losing it, wondering if you never had it, or maybe you had it all along. <laughs> to the Wild West... Let's go! Yay! I mean, heave ho? No. What do you say uh, when you're heading west? Yeah, uh... He, uh, west, 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 ho! ho. <laughs> I'm Katie Nelson. And I'm Olivia Mickle. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating Women You've Never Heard Of. I recently visited Bower's Mansion a historic site outside Carson City, Nevada. Mm. And I'd never heard of Eileen Bowers before my visit. And honestly, it makes me mad. <laughs> she should be an icon. Yeah. And even we live in the Wild West. Right. We, we, We've never heard of her. And we know the Wild West. We're into the Wild West. <laughs> oh, man. This story. Okay. So the curator at the Bowers Mansion has been living with Eileen for decades. Hmm. Okay, I'm Tammy Busick. I am the curator at Bowers Mansion, and I've been here for about 10 years. And I think part of the reason Eileen isn't better known is that the original biographers just made stuff up. Mm. I started, actually, I did a college research paper. Uh -huh. And I come out here, and Betty, the curator, looks through it and says, well, everything's wrong. Huh. But I got an A. <laughs> and I didn't realize, being so young and naive, um, pre-internet, even books are wrong. Wow. And so then I started wondering, well, if the books are wrong, what happened? Yeah. And then I started finding stuff no one had ever seen before, and I just got hooked on the story. 32 many years. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow, that's and so cool. Yeah, like I said, so it just like, turned into my life. 
Tammy has been sifting fact from fiction for years, and she was gracious enough to share the story with me the day before they reopened for the season. Mm. So, had the place all to myself. Nice. Eileen Bowers was born Allison Oram. Born in Forfar, Scotland in 1826. According to family history, uh, her dad was a drover, so they moved a lot. Um, and they ended up in Clackmannan. From that sad, failing port town, she set off on an epic adventure. <laughs> she married when she was 15, and her first husband, Stephen Hunter, was the son of a coal miner. And life was really hard in those days. Um, it was the Industrial Revolution, and landlords controlled the farms. Well, um, Stephen Hunter met some missionaries traveling through the region, and they were spreading a new religion. And they told him that if he came to America and settled in the Salt Lake Valley, he could have a farm of his own and raise a family. And he agreed, converted to Mormonism. Eileen never converted, um, but agreed to travel with her husband. So uh, they go across the ocean down to Louisiana. They then go up the Mississippi and up the Missouri, where they caught a wagon train that was heading west. Um, she was then 22. And the year was 1849. The gold rush. <laughs> Talk about an adventure. <laughs> um, well, they arrive in Salt Lake and they're actually divorced. Um, oh. My guess is they suddenly found different dreams. Stephen wanted to be a Mormon, to settle down and have a little farm. Eileen, obviously not. <laughs> yeah. And I guess they kept in touch for years. This is according to family history. One of the descendants once told me that uh, in Stephen's older years, he always referred to Eileen as the sweetheart of his youth. Eileen has bigger dreams. Seems like she's got her eye on the gold rush, and she's not going to stop here. Well, look at most of the women that came west. They had a choice. They could have stayed home. So, long story short, she marries another Scottish immigrant, Mormon, mm. and the two of them head farther west to the Washoe Valley, nestled in between the Sierra Nevadas and Virginia City. So it's it's almost California. Mm. It's far west Nevada, and it's actually really beautiful. Um, surrounded by desert, but it's got hot springs and cold springs. It's a very beautiful place. So they bought a ranch, and they brought with them her husband's orphaned nephew. Eileen kind of adopted him. Uh. And just as they get set up, all the Mormons are called back to Salt Lake City permanently. <laughs> Her faithful husband is ready to go, and Eileen says, no. I don't think so. I will not be going back. Ooh. <laughs> and he went. He returned without her. The nephew chose to stay with Eileen. And I think Aww. this little detail, it can tell us quite a lot. It tells us about their personalities. Yeah. It tells us about who the nephew was really loyal to. And it tells us how brave she was. <laughs> that she is prepared to stay in the Wild West, way out there, all by herself. Yeah, she was very determined. I mean, she did her own thing. And just on the other side of that hill, uh, was a little mining camp called John Town, um, which is probably one of the most exciting places around. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about um, prospectors and how they lived, and they were just, they're out there dreaming. They're gonna strike it rich. And then what happened was once they struck it rich, well, they didn't really strike it rich, once they found gold, they would sell it and move someplace else. Um, so she's just living with all these dreamers. It's just going to be amazing. The greatest is going to be happen up there. And she had a boarding house. And we have stories that, you know, at the end of a hard day, they would come to her boarding house and they'd just sit around and talk. And I just picture her, I mean, she was only about yay tall, a little on the hefty side, um, just kind of running around and taking care of, care of people and making sure everything's okay and staying up late at night and getting up early in the morning to get the bread going and, you know, pulling, getting the eggs from the chickens. And I just see her as this just little energizer bunny type lady taking care of everything. And, you know, the stories are that she'd take the buggy over the hill. This road didn't even exist. I'm not sure how she went, but she'd bring the buggy down here. Um, and that happens to be the property we're on right now. Hmm. Beautiful property, hot springs, cold springs. I mean, it's just an amazing piece of land. But she'd bring the buggy down here and use the hot springs and do laundry hmm. for all the miners because the mineral waters were so good for laundry. 
Now, she's an uneducated woman. Can she read? I don't know. I don't think hmm. so. But Eile is savvy. She must have been overhearing some pretty interesting conversations at the boarding house. Right. You'd have all the inside scoop. Yeah. Plus, she has her crystal ball. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, she actually had a crystal ball. And she would tell their fortunes, and uh, she was really good at finding lost things and things like that. And it was always just a fun little parlor trick. And it, to me, it was probably one of the best times of her life. I mean, she was free, it was exciting, everyone lived the dream. So it's a good time, but it's not a rich time. And someone called Snowshoe Thompson gives Eile the credit for starting everything. Huh. Uh, he gives her credit for the discovery of the Comstock load. Because supposedly one night in the boarding house, they're all hanging out, and she, she told them where they're supposed to go dig, which was way north of where everyone else was digging. Well, that's where they found what they call the Ofer deposit. That was the biggest chunk of the Comstock load, and that started everything, started the rest of Washoe. That's when Virginia City gets built and everything. So according to Snowshoe Thompson, Eile started it all. <laughs> Can we also just take a moment to mourn that nobody has good nicknames anymore? Oh, I know. I want to be named Snowshoe Thompson. Every single person in this story, I swear, they have the most glorious nicknames. Gotta go back to good nicknames. People rushed the hill, they called it Gold Hill, and they started a new town there. And Eileen's right there with them. She opens another boarding house and she's- She starts really buying and selling mining claims. <laughs> so she's not actually out there digging in the dirt as far as we know, but buying and selling. But there's one particular claim and it's just 10 feet of land. She hangs on to that one. <laughs> the neighboring claims were owned by a shady dealer, Henry Comstock. <laughs> whose nickname, by the way, is Old Pancake, <laughs> and a dashing young teamster from Missouri named Sandy Bowers. <gasps> Sandy was a prospector who didn't sell. He stayed, he worked the mine, created quite the business, kept it going. For him, the mine was everything. He was a Washoe miner. He was proud of being a Washoe miner. That's all he ever wanted. And then that's where the story goes. They joined their claims in their lives forever. And we're married. They fall in love. They get married. Yeah. And they got mining immediately. Everybody else is still just like wondering what, they have no idea what's going on or what they're going to do. And they, and Sandy and Eile are mining mm. instantly. It was the largest mining community in the world. It was just an amazing community and probably one of the most exciting places in the world at the time. And mining this stuff is in no way straightforward. It was unlike anything ever seen. It was the first time they've ever done hard rock mining. Dig straight down, and they did the square set timbering and all that stuff. So Eile and Sandy were right in the, the earliest part of hard rock mining, trying to figure out how to do it. And he had the mine, he had his own mill, he had a blacksmith shop. He had his whole little industry running up there. And bam, the calm stock look. <laughs> the, the richest silver mine in American history. Wow. And the ore they were pulling out, it was super strange. It was like, it was like kind of sticky and really odd. But once they figured out the milling and the extraction process and everything, they realized it was so strange because it was 75% silver, 25% uh. gold. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when they really knew they were rich. Wow. Um, very successful, you know, make a million dollars, more than a million. We just don't have records of how many millions. I can't, I can't imagine. Like, yeah. what are the chances? Wow. Ah. But fortune is a wheel. <laughs> and while their mind is rushing them to dizzying heights, she had a baby. And he died suddenly at two months old. Oh. She had a second baby, a girl she named Teresa Fortunata. Hmm. She's like, this one will be fortunate. But Teresa Fortunata died at three months oh. old. So it's like she did what she could do, yeah. keeping things going. And she never gave up. 
They planned the construction of a grand mansion right in the Washoe Valley where she had washed laundry in the springs <laughs> at the boarding house years ago. The cool thing, because so many of the millionaires, they build their houses in nearby cities, but not the Bowers. So they decided to build their mansion near the mine so he could keep working. Eileen was all about this. She loved her house. She loved spending money. Um, some people say that she spent all their money, which isn't true. Um, she spent a lot of money. <laughs> While it's under construction, they take a tour of Europe, as you do. Mm -hmm. And it seems completely normal for the Gilded Age, except when you realize she's not an American on tour. She's a poor Scottish lass returning oh, yeah. to Europe. She goes back to Scotland. <laughs> oh, how do you like me now? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it's like when you leave Scotland, um, well, you hear all the stories, you know, like in Ireland, they would have wakes yeah. for the people going to America because uh, you're not coming back. Yeah. And Isla got to go back. Um, she actually visited her family, and I've been able to talk to family members, um, or a family member, um, who heard stories from his great-grandmother. Um, about the time Isla came home, which is really cool. Oh my gosh, that must have been amazing. <laughs> oh, it was. Especially at one point. Because again, there's so many myths. Yeah. Uh, one story that I just assumed was a myth was Isla, you know, pulling her carriage over and throwing silver dollars to the children of Scotland. I'm like, yeah, right, sure, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we're driving through somewhere near Forfar, where she was from, and um, he stops the car. And he's like, okay, get out. I'm like, okay. And I get out and he goes, this is the place. I'm like, what are you talking about? This is where my great grandmother stood when Eileen threw a silver dollar to her. I'm like, that's real? I had no idea. So it's hard to tell the difference between myth and yeah. reality when some of the myths are real. That's <laughs> awesome. That's uh, so can great. you imagine? I mean, I, I'm so desperate to watch her return. I was going to say, there's the, that's her. the movie. That's the triumphant. Yeah. And the story goes that because they called her the queen of the Comstock, that she returned as royalty. The newspapers kept wondering if she was going to have an audience with Queen Victoria, because this is one queen visiting another queen. <laughs> they don't understand how, how the UK works, I don't think. Right, yeah. <laughs> They bought tons of furniture for the mansion while they're in Europe and art and, you know, all that. Mm. Uh, but they also picked up something very unusual. They acquire a little girl. Uh, still not sure how. The story is they were aboard a ship called the Persia when an unmarried woman by the name of Margaret died giving childbirth. They bribed the captain to make no record, took the baby as their own, and named her Margaret Persia. Um, I've traveled, gone through all their records, and that didn't happen. We now know every ship they were on, and we have the passenger logs of every ship, and there's no way she could have been born on the Persia. <laughs> wow. Um, but yeah, they raised her as their own, and so she lived here with Sandy and Eileen. And, and her name is Persia. There's, there's, a, <laughs> there's her baby picture. She is. Back home, baby in arms, they moved into the mansion. It is so grand. Their doorknobs are made of gold and silver from their minds. <laughs> and like their hinges and all their hardware. This is just wow. so over the top. So this is the formal parlor um, where she would have entertained guests. Uh, Alice Addenbrook, the first curator, um, one, of, one of the women who saved it in the late 40s, she actually talked to really old people who were really little when Eileen was still alive. And she would say, well, what do you remember of the house? Because they were trying to recreate it. And several of the kids said they remembered the first room with bright red furniture. So everything's been reupholstered. <laughs> but we have bright red furniture um, to match what hopefully Eileen actually had. This is the smoking room where the men retire after dinner. They you know, pat themselves on the back for being masters of the universe. And it was cut off. So the ladies could be over there and the men could be over here. Oh. But considering this is West and women had different roles out West, I am sure the women were in here telling the men what to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, fireplaces are from Italy, from what we're told. Um, supposedly, that is Queen Victoria on the mantle. 
Most people say how giving and how caring and, you know, again, you just welcome people into the mansion. And so that's my image. And we have some newspaper articles written by a guy, uh, Dr. Bishop, who remembers the family, uh, how, how caring she was and taking care of people. And his family first came through the valley. Um, they were in a wagon and they pull up and she's talking to him and she's like, oh, the baby needs some milk. Sandy, go get some, go get some milk for the baby. And they're just taking care of this little baby, you know, and these are strangers. But he says that's the type of person she was. But again, fortune is a wheel. Aww. Almost immediately, the mine dries up. Hmm. Pretty much as soon as they move in, they're broke. <laughs> so that didn't quite work out for them. Other mine owners would have just closed it up, walked away with their millions intact. Hmm. But he took care of his men. He wouldn't lay them off when the mine played out. He kept paying them, took care of everyone until they didn't have any more money to keep it open any longer. And then, after a particularly hard, hard winter, winter became a followed by a quick spring thaw, mm -hmm. which happens around here a lot. Their mine and the mill... So the ravine flooded, flooded took out the mill. Threatening to wash away wow. in the flood, Sandy rushed out there himself to um, try trying to, to save, save it. it. And we think he got pneumonia. Exacerbated his miner's lung. Mm. So it just says a lung complaint, but in mining it could have been about anything. And died. Aww. And he was only 35. <sighs> I think Fortune's Wheel is easier now than... <laughs> yeah! <laughs> it spins a little <laughs> slower these days. <laughs> You're right. She buried him on a hill behind the mansion and thought, what do I do now? <sighs> Let's pause for a moment to thank our sponsors. Girls Can Crate is awesome. And I know some parents are like us staring into that yawning, empty chasm of summer, <laughs> realizing we've got to find something new for our children to do. <laughs> That's where Girls Can Crate is a lifesaver. Every month, they'll deliver a brand new real-life Shiro to your front door, introducing kids to a fascinating woman who changed the world, complete with a gorgeous 28-page activity book, all the materials for two to three STEAM activities like experiments, art projects. For busy families, they have digital subscriptions and mini crates too. Check them out now at girlscancrate, C-R-A-T-E dot com, and use the coupon code HERNAME, all one word, to get 20% off your first month's crate. The Transcontinental Railroad was just completed. Hmm. Railroads are the future. Hmm. And so she And thought, she has a seer stone. Yes! <laughs> she could see the future. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll show you Eileen's favorite room. She knew that the railroad was coming and people were coming. And so she said, Ha! Huh, I will now turn my mansion into a resort. Ah. And the kitchen. This is her favorite room? Well, this is where she spent all of her time. Because oh. especially in those days, this is a room that where you could heat it up. And uh, when she turned it into a boarding house, um, this is where she would have worked from. Wow. And so she would have spent most of her time in here. And everything we hear, she was a hard worker. She never had servants. She's keeping up this house <laughs> herself. Wow. She's doing all the work. Wow. And her gamble paid off. The railroad did arrive, just as her crystal ball predicted. Mm -hmm. You can see about halfway between here and the freeway, yeah. um, there's like a little line of fence post out there. Uh -huh. uh, that is the actual uh, V&T right of way. So that's where the Virginia and Truckee Railroad came. And so then you can like, come down for a picnic. And, and, right about the same time, a second vein of silver was found in the Comstock. Mm. They do find silver further down, and it becomes the big bonanza. And the strike was bigger than the first one. Mm. 
miners and their families flocked by the thousands. Mm. And Eileen's mansion, it was the only green and lovely space anywhere. Mm. And she hosted picnics. <laughs> and when I say picnics, I mean like massive festival events, the highlight of the year. Right. A fate. The picnic year is always fun to read the old newspapers as they're leading up to the picnics. It's like, you know, this is where you want to buy your food. This is the fancy hat for the season. Make sure you have your new hat because you had to have a hat. Wow. <laughs> the biggest picnic of the year um, was the Miners Union. The only time they ever closed the mines was so people could come to Bowers. People would start meeting way before the sun even came out. And the railroad, first they'd pick up people in Virginia City. Then they'd go down to Gold Hill and bands would be playing and the cars were all decorated and they would actually add more cars. Most of them were flatbeds, um, with just chairs, you know, that's really safe. Um, <laughs> then they'd go down to Silver City and pick up some more. Then they'd go all the way to Carson and they'd pick up some more. Um, according to the newspapers, the longest train ever going through Washoe Valley was coming here. And so, you know, it'd stop here and people would start getting off and they said you couldn't even see the end of it. And you know, people would drop off all along and they'd come out here. At one time there was a boardwalk that went from here to the railroad, you know, because you don't want ladies soiling their dresses. Oh, that's yes. yeah. And that's about a half mile. Yeah, you know, she had the fountain, she kept the gra the grounds groomed. And over here behind that fence, there's a round pool, stone line, just like the mansion, and that was a hot spring pool. Oh. It had an island in the middle. Oh. Then out here in this grassy area was another big pool. Um, it was deep enough to have a diving board. Don't know how safe it was, but yeah, they had a diving board out there. You could swim, you could play. They had games. They had bands playing all day long. They had to, you know, bring their picnics. Wow. And it was a full day event, and they wouldn't get home until well off dark. What boy or girl ever forgot their first picnic at Bowers Mansion in Washoe Valley? where for the first time in their lives, they saw clear running brooks, great pine trees, wide meadows spangled with flowers, and beyond the meadows, the shimmering expanse of Washoe Lake. It was a trip to paradise. I actually one time created a calendar for like three full years. <laughs> And it's like, go based on newspaper articles. When's a picnic, Aww. when's a picnic, when's a picnic. And it's like almost every weekend and sometimes even during the week. And people would be out here uh, picnicking. And you hear like great things like, you know, um, anyone who didn't have a great time only had themselves to blame. You know, um, I, talking about how, what a great hostess Eileen was. Oh, you have to see Persia's room. But, fortune, it's a wheel. <laughs> Persia's rooms. And we believe that little uh, glider is hers. Aww. And these are, these are, of course, my favorite rooms. And these were my favorite to decorate. Oh, come on. And I do, ha I do have tea parties when no one's around. Persia, age 12? died. Oh. They think her appendix burst. Oh. I know. Oh. These dolls were all donated. All the other dolls you see in the house um, are mine. Really? I've always wanted little china dolls oh and gosh. so now I buy them and bring them in here. <laughs> How awesome! And I try to have a little bit of Persia all over the place um, and when I give the tour I literally go through the history. So we start with Eileen, they become rich. We come up here, we talk about Persia's birth, we talk about Sandy's death, we talk about the picnics. And then we go down to the downstairs bedroom. Um, Persia lives in Reno, because she actually went to school there for a while. And that's when um, she got what we believe was appendicitis and actually died while living in Reno. And so when I, I tell that part of the story downstairs, there's like a little doll in the bed. And so it's kind of like Persia leaving home and Never coming back. Yeah. How old was she? She was 12 years old. And so again, for Eileen, that would have been devastating. Um, Sandy died in 68. Uh, Persia died in 74. And so, yeah, she had lost everything. A 
And even before she's really recovered from that loss, the mines dried up. Mm. And so when the mines played out, again, people leave. You're not going to go for a picnic. You're not going to pay to go to a picnic. The big bonanza ends. And she got desperate. Creditors hovered. She even tried the old U.S. government. And she said, hey, remember when I was a millionaire and I donated a huge chunk of money to the union cause for the Civil War? <laughs> remember that? Would you help a lady out? And they said no. no. Yeah. Sell your doorknobs? Well, yes, but sell your doorknobs Eileen Bowers style. Yeah. <laughs> the spirit of it is so innovative. She tried a raffle. She decided, ah. if I'm going to sell, I'm going to make it about luck. This yeah. is going to be for the public. And she, so she sold tickets. You could pay $2.50 for a raffle ticket. Mm. And then on the day of the raffle, she was going to raffle off literally everything, item by item, including the mansion itself. <laughs> I love it. So you buy one raffle ticket, you go, you're going to get something. You might get a silver doorknob. You might get a painting. You might get a mansion. You might get, I don't know, a cast iron stove. Like, she's just going to raffle off everything. (laughs) I love the spirit of it. That's, that's Eileen, like, reveling in luck. Yeah. The ultimate leveler. <laughs> yes. And I, it seems so egalitarian, too. She's not going to sell it on to some other millionaire. Yeah. She's like, no, let's just sell it to the people. Yeah. Bit by bit. It didn't work. Uh, not enough money. She didn't sell enough tickets. Yeah. And it didn't happen. And that's when she ended up losing it to taxes. Taxes. Taxes will take everybody. They, one time, this was the most heavily taxed property in Washoe County. And she just couldn't keep up with it. So she was forced out, everything sold at auction. After that, it just went through a series of owners who couldn't afford to keep it going. And then the house slowly fell into disrepair. Mm. So now what? All along, she'd had that crystal ball. Mm. And she didn't tell me fortunes too much in the mansion, just a a fun little entertaining thing. Yeah. Um, after she lost the mansion, uh, she actually manages to turn it into a career. Because again, Eileen does not stop. She became a wandering fortune teller <laughs> for years. Wow. It was part of her Scottish heritage. Uh, we do know there were a lot of uh, Scottish fortune tellers, um, the crystal ball reading and everything. She predicted people's deaths. Uh. She predicted a great fire that burned Virginia City to the ground. It, it actually did happen. <laughs> a lot of people really believed whatever she predicted. They called her the Washoe Seeress. Ooh, see? Nicknames. Yeah, nicknames. But she's like a, a kind of shabby, Aww. kind of crazy old lady. Yeah. People were buying fire insurance when she said there was going to be a fire. Um, But again, she's hit and miss. So, you know, it's like, I could guess too. (laughs) But yeah, it was in slow news days, it was always in the papers. And she lived to be 77, which is a ripe old age in those uh, those days. And so she traveled around telling fortunes, um, ended up in San Francisco, and was actually listed as an astrologer. Uh, when I try to picture her, you know, like in detail, what does she look like? What is her setup? Is she just on the side of the road just saying, hey, I'll tell your fortune for uh, a penny? Um, And a lot of people know her and they they go to see her not really because they want their fortune told, but because it's a way to support her. And I suppose not with great success because she ended up uh, back in the Washoe poorhouse. And here's the Reno Gazette's description of the Washoe poorhouse from 1901, which is right when she would have been Mm. there. The Reno Gazette says it's an unsanitary building, a disgrace. We urge all to see for himself the shack into which the county stuffs the aged and the ill. Mm. Sadly, she outlived most of her friends. And so by the, the end, with her dementia, telling fortunes, 
People were done with her, and they didn't quite realize everything she had done. Washoe County and San Francisco, they actually engaged in a legal dispute about who was obliged to care for Eileen Bowers. Aww. In the end, Washoe plopped her on a train, gave her $30, and sent her to California. Uh. She lived her remaining years in the King's Daughter's Home for Incurables Aww. in Oakland, California. <sighs> the more things change... Can you imagine working there? You'd be it's like the queen of the Comstock. Yeah. See that see that woman over there with the crystal ball? Wow. She owned the richest silver mine in American history. <laughs> she died penniless, Ugh. utterly unknown in 1903. Hmm. But the house, even though it sat there decaying, it was still a destination for people. Mm. And the house maybe never was really hers. It was for the people, like, from the very yeah. beginning. Eileen, we know, didn't have any children that lived to be adults. Um, but it's always been a home for children. Mm. It's always been a park, a playing atmosphere. Mm. And to me, the best time is giving tours when kids are playing right out front and you can hear kids screaming from the swimming pool and laughing and yeah. it's like that's what this is all about yeah. that's what Eileen loved and that's what she kept going and everyone after her has managed you know to keep it going oh my gosh. I love that. So, so a fundraising campaign began in the 1940s to restore the mansion and to make the grounds a public park hmm. and thus it has been ever since <laughs> we grew up playing there <laughs> You know, our parents grew up playing there. Our children grew up playing there. We've got to keep that going. I knew, I knew how important Bowers Mansion was, but I didn't realize it until the, my first year as curator out here. Um, because of the recession, it closed down for five years. I come in, start doing inventory. We start changing everything. We're figuring out how we're going to do everything. We still hadn't figured out how to do everything. And we're like, okay, let's have a quiet opening the weekend before Memorial Day weekend because no one will know we're out there. We'll take a few people through, try the new tour, get things going, and the press found out. And the first tour was like two people. It's like, yay, we got two people. The next tour was like 20 people. <laughs> the next tour was like 50 people. <laughs> Through the entire weekend, every tour was so big, we, we didn't know how to handle it. Tour after tour after tour, just full of people. And I swear this is true, this is not made up. On Sunday, the last tour, I'm down there and there's like 10 people. Oh my God, thank God. Just a few people. I might be able to survive the day. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing up by the fountain and I look down, you know, this little road that you came in on. I look down that way. I swear it was like filled of dreams. A line of cars. I was like, oh my God. And every, they're parking everywhere. And they're all coming on the tour. And it was just amazing. And every time people would be telling me their stories of them coming out here and how thankful they were that it was open again because it was part of their history. And when she told me that story, I got chills because hmm. the visuals, I mean, I was looking out at the Washoe Valley, the symmetry, there's the endless train cars coming to the picnics and then there's an endless train of cars coming back when the mansion's open again. That's awesome. A couple Fourth of July's ago, they guesstimated around 2,000 people out here. Wow. It was insane, and I couldn't even imagine the Miners Union picnic. Uh, right. And you just, you know, it's like, I am so thankful to have this job. It's like, I get to take care of this home that has so many good memories yeah. for people. Oh, yay. So cool. So cool. So I assume she's another to add to our list of buried in an unmarked grave. Oh, actually, no. Oh. Somebody, a sympathetic owner in the meantime, in the between years when it was decaying, and he had her ashes brought to Bowers Mansion. Oh. And so now all of them, the three kids and Sandy and Eileen, they're buried together on the hill up above the mansion. And that's one of the traditions oh. for people when they visit. They go and they picnic and they hike up to visit the graves on the top of the hill. Oh, that's awesome. She had a hard life. You got to admit, 
crashing the planes in 49, living up in Chinatown, running a boarding house of this size. This is not a little boarding house. I mean, it was a resort, the picnics and everything. And then, you know, telling fortunes and traveling around and, you know, that was a hard life. To me, the coolest thing is she never gave up, no matter what. And so that's what we like to, to think of, not, you know, the end. Because the end is kind of sad. But then again, when I look at from the time she left Liverpool um, in 1849 to the time she lost the mansion in May of 1876, in my entire life, I will never have even close to that adventure. <laughs> so really, it, it, no matter how it ends, for that time period, she saw it all. She was here before Nevada was even a thought. She saw it become a state. Um, they were living up in, you know, Gold Hill at the height of the boom and, you know, it was like one of the most exciting places in the world and, you know, she saw it all. It was part of it. The story is so amazing of everything that she did and accomplished. Things slowed down at the end, but you know, hey, I'm retired. Things are slowing down for me too. <laughs> Special thanks to curator Tammy Busick for bringing us the story of Eileen Bowers. If you want to learn more about Eileen Bowers, visit our website, whatshernamepodcast.com, where we have lots of photos from my trip to the mansion, links to more resources, including a booklet about Eileen Bowers written by Tammy Busick. Or you can visit the mansion itself. It's outside Carson City, Nevada. I highly recommend it. Our newsreel man is James Henderson. Music for this episode was recorded by Andy Reiner and John Souza from their album Canyon Sunrise, Half Pelican, and an Antique Player Piano. You can find links to all this music in our show notes at whatshernamepodcast.com, and this interview was recorded on site by Meredith Henderson. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post all kinds of additional content each week. We're so grateful for all of our sponsors. You can become a patron for as little as a buck a month to help make more episodes happen, and participating at different levels gets you all kinds of rewards like subversive cross-stitch patterns, trading cards, and more. You can find everything by clicking donate at whatshernamepodcast.com. Thank you for donating. Thank you for listening. There are certain words I do not say in interviews oh. because I'm afraid they're going to, you know, bit in peace yeah. and oh, yeah. make it sound yeah, like yeah. I said something. So there's certain words I do not say. Like what? Like I'm not going to say oh, it. I, say <laughs> yeah, I promise I won't. I promise.